So he says that the Andean convert's interest in confessing their sins to Jesuit priests and asking for advice about how to live more like, like Christians is something that caused a big change in ejemplar mudanza in their behavior and in their customs. And so he was arguing that confession was apparently the fastest route for converting and assimilating indigenous people to Christian and Spanish culture. And a lot of missionaries in Spanish America shared this same idea, but Peru is actually a really interesting case because the tools for evangelizing indigenous people came directly from the church rather than from individual missionaries, which is what happened in New Spain and in the Antilles and other colonies. So in 16th century Peru, there was actually only one manual that was approved for use. It was called the Doctrina Cristiana y Catecismo para Instrucción de Indios, and it was published in 1585. And it was composed by an official council of clergy members, which was called the Tercer Concilio Limense, or the Third Lima Council. And our friend Acosta here was actually a very prominent member of the council. So because it was composed by this official body, it gives us a lot of insights into the strategies and the goals that the Church of Peru had for interacting with Andean people. So today what we're going to do is look very specifically at how the Third Lima Council's manual incentivized people to participate in activities like self-surveillance and self-reporting to authority figures. And then we're going to look at how the Church of Peru attempted to use that activity of self-surveillance to reinforce colonial power structures and to uphold political and financial interests of the Spanish regime. So to start, we're gonna talk briefly about confession, what confession is and about what confessional manuals are and what they're for. And then we'll get into examples from the third Lima Council's materials. Um, so here, I just wanna show you before we get started, uh, two images. These images come from the Primer Nueva Coronica y Buen Gobierno by Felipe Goman Poma de Ayala, who is an Andean chronicler and artist. And maybe you're going to read some of, of his work in your class, I'm not sure. Um, but you can see here some representations of how confession happens between Spanish priests and Andean people. So on the left side, we have Sacramento de la Confesión, and here the priest is behaving correctly. But on the right side, we have Mala Confesión, and here the priest is actually abusing a penitent, a woman who is pregnant. So this is kind of what we're getting into today. So we're gonna look at examples from the Confessionario, which is a confessional manual, and also from the Tercero Catecismo, which is a collection of sermons. And we'll see hopefully how the Church of Peru is using confession to identify all the behaviors that it considers undesirable as sins. So the goal is to discourage Andean social, political, and economic customs, and also to discourage any actions that might contradict the financial and the political interests of colonial power and colonial people. So let's start with confession. Confession, and I'm sorry if this is something that you already know, but in case you don't, it's a Catholic sacrament, which is a religious rite. And in confession, a person tells a priest, a Catholic priest about offenses that she has committed against God or against the church. And the idea is to get forgiveness for the offenses. So the person making the confession is usually called a penitent, because supposedly she feels penitent about the bad things she did. And the offenses are usually called sins. Uh, and most of the time, sins are thoughts or actions that are breaking the church's rules for individual behavior. So like the 10 commandments, which we will get into a little later. Um, so the priest is able to forgive the penitent on God's behalf on the condition that she performs some actions to show that she's actually sorry for what she did. Um, usually it's saying some prayers or doing something to help a family member, or a community member, and those actions that the priest assigns are called penances. Um, so in the early church, like in the first few centuries of the common era, um, penitents could actually only confess one time in their lives. So they like had to pick the best possible moment to do that. It was usually right before they died. Um, and when you confessed, you had to perform really extreme penances, like forms of self-mutilation or self-humiliation, and you had to do it in a big group and in public. So that's what this image is showing. There's all these people wearing weird hats. Some of them are carrying little whips to hit themselves. Um, some of them are shouting out things that they've done or bad thoughts that they've had. And the idea is that it's this very public form of humiliation and punishment. Um, 
so this form of confession, you can see it was mostly based on fear and it didn't really provide people with much guidance or teach them anything about how to live good lives. So in the 13th century, the church decided that they would change it and people should only conf should confess actually once a year instead of only one time in their lives and that they could confess in private. So that's what you can see here. Here's Guaman Poma's image again. And you can see it's just one penitent with the priest. And even actually in the 16th century, this thing was invented called the confessional. So the priest is in this box and there's a screen between the priest and the penitent. So there's even more privacy. Um, and so the idea was to make confession more accessible and less scary. So when confession becomes more frequent, that's where confessional manuals come in because people start confessing more often and they're confessing in more detail because it's every year. Um, the priests who are hearing the confessions and the people who are making the confessions need some tools to help them figure out what behaviors count as sins and what types of penance are appropriate for those sins. The first confessional manuals were created in Celtic monasteries in the sixth and seventh centuries. And they were literally just lists, just lists of different sins and the best ways to atone for them. But by the 16th century, when we're talking about, confessional manuals were super popular all across Europe. And they had turned into these really long books with all kinds of lessons about how you make a good confession and how you live a virtuous life and other kinds of moral lessons. And the other thing they were doing is they were teaching people kind of indirectly about all of the church's rules and precepts for good behavior, because they would organize the contents of the book according to those rules. So here you can see some examples. This one on the left is Martín das Pilcuetas Manual de Confesores y Penitentes, which is from 1549. And on the right, we have the Guía de Pecadores of Fray Luis de Granada of 1556. These are both from Spain and they were both super popular. They were bestsellers actually in Spain in that century. If you can believe it, that's what people were reading. Um, so let's look at the tables of contents and you can see what I mean about the organization. So both of these books are going to organize the way that they talk about common vices or common sins that people commit according to what the church calls the seven deadly sins. These are just seven really common sort of big categories of sin that include things like pride, lust, wrath, right? So you can see here, here it is, siete pecados capitales, que el vulgo llama mortales, right? So this is how he's going to start talking about sin. In Fray Luis, it's even more clear. So he's giving you remedios contra la soberbia, pride, avaricia, avarice, lujuria, lust, etc. So he's actually going sin by sin here, yeah? And then on the other hand, when they want to talk about virtue and how to live a good life, you can see that Aspilcueta is arranging his by the Ten Commandments, right? So you got the First Commandment, Second Commandment, and so on. And he's going to give you lists in there of the ways to follow the commandments, but also common ways that people break the commandments. And you can't actually see it here, but Fray Luis uses a different system. He uses what's called the seven theological and cardinal virtues, which is like the opposite of the seven deadly sins. But the idea in both cases, and sort of more generally, is to make these manuals as useful as possible and also very instructive. So you could just consult it really quickly if you're getting ready to go to confession um, and you can't figure out what you should confess about. Or you can say, you know what, I really want to make a study about gluttony and I'm going to read this whole chapter and really think about gluttony and, and how it affects me. Um, and so the more you interact with the book, the more you start memorizing these lists, right? You memorize the seven sins or you memorize the Ten Commandments and you just have them in your mind. And so you internalize the rules and it's easier for you to follow them is kind of the idea. So in 16th century Spain, there were manuals like this. In Spanish America, confessors actually had much more specialized tools, which were confessional manuals that were bilingual or multilingual in Spanish and in American languages. So especially in the early decades of evangelization, right, mostly in the 16th century, these manuals were really important tools for missionaries because they didn't always have the linguistic knowledge or the cultural knowledge to make confessions effectively with indigenous people. And the Church of New Spain took kind of a different approach. They left it up to individual missionaries to create these manuals and circulate them. But the Church of Peru, starting as early as 1545, worked to develop an official set of multilingual evangelical manuals so that 
all the missionaries in Peru would deliver very consistent information to new converts. And it took them a few tries, but in 1583, the delegates to the third Lima council, again, including our friend Acosta, wrote three documents. They wrote a catechism, which you can see here. They wrote a confessionario, confessional manual, and they wrote a collection of sermons. And they wrote them in Spanish, and then they turned them over to a committee of translators who were all clergy members, all Spanish people. And those folks translated all these documents into Quechua and Aymara. So you can see in all of these pages, you got the Spanish, the Quechua, and the Aymara. So those are the two most widely spoken languages in Peru, which is why they chose Quechua and Aymara, although there are many, many other languages that are also spoken in Peru, and they got left out. Um, the idea here was that the three texts are going to work in concert, right? So missionaries would use the catechism, this first one, to teach their indigenous students the basic tenets of Christianity. The sermons would be to connect all of those ideas with stories from the Bible and other types of stories about people's lives. And then the confessional manual, which was really like the jewel of the whole thing, was to assess whether or not Andean Christians were actually living their lives according to these Christian ideals. Um, and the confessionario was intended for use with the general population as were the other two documents, but it was kind of special because it also included some sections, and we're gonna look at some of them, that were specifically oriented toward Andean community leaders. So there's a section for curacas who are like overseers, fiscales who were royal accountants, alguaciles who are kind of like sheriffs or sort of low level law enforcement, and then huilcas who are spiritual guides and healers in Andean religion. So, all right, why are we focusing on confession in particular? Why is the Church of Peru so interested in that? Well, so it's a pretty effective way to encourage very like desired or specific behaviors among populations that are hard to supervise because it kind of works like self-policing. And that was really helpful to Spanish missionaries in Peru for two main reasons. The first reason being geography and the second reason being language. For about the first 50 years of colonization, Spanish colonization, the number of missionaries in Peru was actually very small. And the Andean folks that were in rural areas would only encounter priests and confessors like two or three times a year, if that. And even when they did get out there, missionaries often didn't speak Andean languages skillfully enough to have a complicated conversation about something like sins. Today, there are actually 45 different languages that are spoken in the Andes. And in the 16th century, there were even more because some have gone extinct. But most missionaries only spoke either Quechua or Daimarda. And that problem only got worse after this confessionario. The second reason that self-policing is so important is that the Inquisition didn't have the legal right to examine or to punish indigenous people anywhere in the Americas. So confession gave the Church of Peru some alternative ways to gather information about indigenous cultural and religious practices and to teach Andean people about Spanish and Christian norms. Basically, it created an excuse for priests to ask people very invasive questions about their beliefs, their neighbors' beliefs, their behaviors, their neighbors' behaviors, and also to teach people about self-discipline, which is basically a form of self-surveillance, right? So that brings us to our main question, which is how do you teach people to surveil themselves? And probably more important than that, how do you motivate them to surveil themselves? And then maybe the most important question of all, how do you get them to tell you about whatever they've discovered while they were surveilling themselves? So let's start with how the Third Lima Council's materials taught people to practice self-surveillance. Okay, this is a long quotation, but uh, what we'll see is that both the Confessionario and the Tercero Catecismo, the collection of sermons, give Andean penitents very practical instructions about how they should surveil themselves. They give lists of questions that the penitents should ask themselves once a day in order to figure out whether or not they're sinning, and if they are, which sins are they committing? So the self-examination in the confessionario, which is up here on the screen, encourages the penitent to think about how she's observing Christian norms, both externally in her life and then internally, like in her mind and in her soul. Is she performing good works like giving alms or helping other people? Is she praying regularly? Is she thinking about Jesus? 
And then surprise, surprise, is she upholding good Christian habits like examining her conscience regularly and keeping track of her sins? So you can see here, right? Que obras haces? So that's the good works. What prayers are you saying and when? Are you giving alms or doing good things for others? And then you've got other forms of penitence. Are you thinking about Christ, etc.? And then you've got down here at the end, que esas cosas hacen los buenos cristianos y especialmente a la mañana cuando se levantan, llaman a Dios, se ofrecen a él pidiéndole ayuda para no pecar aquel día. Y a la noche antes de dormir, miran si han hecho algún pecado, right? So they're self-examining. They're thinking about what they did that day and figuring out if they sinned, right? And then proponiendo de confesarle al padre. So they're preparing to confess it to the priest. So what we're seeing is that the confesionario is encouraging Andean folks to observe Christian norms by associating the adoption of all these habits of self-examination with salvation and the failure to observe them with sin. So the text singles out the daily efforts to follow God's law and to scrutinize one's own behavior for instances of sin as defining features of being a good Christian. And so it's pretty clear that what's going on here is an effort to instill habits of self-surveillance, right? Self-examining, self-policing, self-reporting. You're supposed to tell the sins that you've identified during your daily ritual to the priest the next time that you see him. And in the meantime, you should try to change your behavior and avoid committing the same sins over and over again. So the Tercero Catecismo does something kind of similar, but it gives penitents even more specific instructions for a self-examination. So it tells them what questions to ask themselves, but it also tells them how to remember and keep track of the answers. So there's a bunch of different sermons in the book, and this comes from Sermon 12, where the priest reminds the penitents, or sorry, he recommends that the penitents keep a physical tally of which sins they've committed and how many times in the same way that they might keep account of goods in a storehouse. So he says, de pensar bien tus pecados y hacer quipo de los. And we're going to talk about what a quipo is in a minute. Eh, Como haces quipo cuando eres tambo camayo, which is the keeper of a storehouse. De lo que das y de lo que te deben, right? So it's keeping this physical account. And so now he gives sort of a list that you need to, to keep track not only of the bad things you've done, but also of the bad thoughts that you've had, right? So this attempt is super interesting because it's trying to repurpose a native Andean technology to serve a Christian end. So a quipu, oh, sorry, I wanted to show you guys the page. This is actually what the Tercer Catecismo looks like. So you can see this is the quotation that was just on the screen, but here it is in the actual book just so you can take a peek at that. Um, so let's talk about kipus. The kipu is a system of knotted cords that the Incas used for accounting and for record keeping. It was in use in the Andes starting in about 1400 from the common era. And it was, it's been in use continuously actually ever since. There are still people who use kipus and know how to read them. Um, so the tambo camayo is a tampu camayuk. It's a storekeeper, a person who works in a storehouse. And those people traditionally used kipus to keep track of their inventory. So it's kind of interesting because 16th century missionaries were trying to eliminate a lot of aspects of Andean culture, right? They didn't want people to worship local deities. They didn't want people to eat coca leaves, but they were actively encouraging people to keep using kipus. So what's the difference? Well, surprise, surprise, kipus are very helpful for self-surveillance, right? If you make a kipu of your sins, you become the keeper of your own spiritual storehouse, right? So instead of tracking how many units you have of each good, you track the instances of different sins, like how many times you lusted after a neighbor, how many times you thought about stealing somebody's alpaca, sometime, how many times you thought about punching a priest. And the sermon really stresses that you should keep track like we, like we saw, of sins of action and also sins of thought. And so they give this example of wanting to steal somebody's blanket, but not doing it because you're afraid of being punished um, or thinking about harming your boss, but not daring to go through with it. So this really reinforces the idea that disobeying political leaders or any other spiritual leader is, is sinful. But it also shows that the priest can't really tell how much Andean folks respect or fear members of colonial, representatives of colonial power. And so they're using the sacrament of confession to try and figure that out. 
They're trying to see like, how scared are you of the bureaucrats and the law enforcement folks that are moving around? How, how much do you care about their punishment and how fearful are you of them? So now that we've looked a little bit at the kipus, and just for fun, I wanted to show you a picture from Guaman Poma, which is a kipu kamayuk, a person who creates and reads kipus. Now that we've talked about that, and we have a sense of how the confessionario and the tercero catecismo are teaching people to practice self-surveillance, let's take a look at how they're actually motivating people to do it. Performing a daily self-examination to see how well you're conforming to a totally new set of social rules and then telling an authority figure about all the mistakes that you made so he can punish you for them. It's like not really a fun time. It's not something that people are really eager to do and it, especially not when they're scared of punishment and persecution for continuing to observe their own rituals and follow their own cultural norms. So even though the Inquisition couldn't punish people directly, the policy of assigning public penances for crimes against the faith still made a lot of Andean people very worried about being punished for what the church called idolatry or any kind of continued recognition of Andean gods, deities, and practicing any kind of religious rituals that weren't Christian. And so the fear of all these different things the fear of God being mad at you, the fear of the priest being mad at you, of public shame, humiliation, convinced a lot of Andean penitents to avoid confession altogether. And then even people who did go would avoid mentioning any sins that they thought the priest would get mad about. And we can actually see an example of this fear of punishment in that same letter that I quoted at the beginning from the Jesuits. So one of the missionaries who contributes to the letter tells a story about an Andean Christian who avoided confession for seven years because he was afraid that the priest would punish him for helping a friend to commit suicide. And so he writes, Acudio un pobre indio enfermo que había siete años que por medio de los curas tenía encubierto un pecado, y era que rogándole otro indio hechicero que le enterrase vivo por medio que tuvo del padre que otros le habían acusado lo hizo así. Y así quiso más el otro de ser enturado vivo que no castigado por el cura. So the friend who died was also very scared of the priest's punishment and anger, so much so that he actually preferred suicide to whatever punishment the priest was going to assign him for being an idolater, for being a tisero, a religious leader, a spiritual leader of the Andean faith. So these two men's extreme fear of the priest, we can see presents a big obstacle to the church's efforts to surveil Andean people's behavior because they were so scared of how the priest was gonna punish them. The priest didn't find out that one of them was a spiritual leader for at least seven years, which is not exactly a success story for the missionaries. So we have to see how the Lima council is trying to overcome this fear and resistance to making confessions because we know that people are feeling very, very scared. The confessionario and the tercero catecismo try to convince Andean Christians to participate in this self-surveillance activity by presenting it as the only way that they can protect themselves from even scarier things and even longer lasting punishments. God being mad at them, spiritual sickness, and also eternal damnation, like pretty scary stuff. So at the beginning of the confession, before anything happens, the priest is supposed to deliver this long exhortation telling the penitent that she can save her soul by making a complete confession of every single one of her sins. But if she skips even one sin, her confession will become totally invalid and she actually will commit another sin, which is the sin of lying. But at the same time, the priest reassures the penitent that everything that she says to him is completely private. And if he shares anything that she confesses to him with somebody else, he is gonna go to hell. So that's what gets laid out here, right? If you tell me all of your sins, you'll be saved. If you hide one, your confession is worth nothing. And in fact, you make another graver sin. So tell me everything. Don't be ashamed. God will forgive you. And I won't tell anybody. <clears throat> and so he makes clear what the punishments are going to be, right? He's very insistent about the rules against punishing the penitent or revealing her secrets. And so he's trying to prevent situations like the ones that the Jesuits described, where the penitent either omits certain sins from her confession because she's scared of being punished, or she just avoids confession altogether. And so instead, the priest 
kind of tries to incentivize her by offering love, right? He says, te querré mucho. And he offers his loyalty. No los diré a nadie aunque me maten, which is pretty strong. So he's saying these are rewards that you get along, of course, with God's forgiveness if you participate in this activity of self-surveillance. The tercero catecismo is much creepier in its approach to motivating people. In that same sermon that we already saw, Sermon 12, the priest tells the penitents that unconfessed sins will rot or poison their souls over time, and that each individual sin is a creepy crawly animal, like a toad or a cockroach that sits inside your body. So the only way to get all of these vermin out of your body is, surprise, to confess all your sins. Right? And you can see what is happening here. Sabe que cuantos pecados dices, tantos demonios y sapos feos vomitas. Y si callas alguno, todos se vuelven luego a ti. Un cristiano se confesaba una vez y vio otro cristiano que como se iba confesando sus pecados, así le iban saliendo por su boca otras tantos sapos muy sucios. Y vio más que de ahí un rato, porque aquel cristiano cayó un pecado por vergüenza, que luego volvieron todos los sapos a entrarse uno a uno por la boca. Gross, right? The idea that your body is infested with toads or cockroaches or rats is very, very disturbing. And you can see how the sermon is relying on images of touch and taste, right? This feeling of like vomiting up and then swallowing slimy, wriggly, dirty toads. So it's making all of the listeners feel this very strong visceral response. And you can see too that the toads are not metaphorical. This sermon is not talking about toads as an abstract idea or an image. They are literal toads. And the sermon even has an eyewitness account of someone who saw this happen to another person of toads jumping into their mouth, right? So the priest is trying to make all of the listeners believe that this will actually happen to them if they don't confess all their sins, right? He's using fear to motivate them to participate in self-surveillance. So now we've seen how the Third Lima Council is teaching people to practice self-surveillance and how they're encouraging and motivating them to practice it. So let's look at some of the ways that they're using that control over Andean people's consciences to encourage them to uphold colonial power structures and also to support the interests of big institutions like the church and the Spanish crown. The confessionario is defining all kinds of social, sexual, political, and economic activities as sins, right? It's like recharacterizing all these things in terms of sin in order to be able to police Andean people's behaviors with this goal ultimately of making Andean people into obedient subjects and keeping them from resisting or protesting against the colonial regime's exploitation of their labor and their resources and the extreme restriction of their rights. So like many other colonial confessional manuals, the Confessionario used the Ten Commandments to prohibit as wide a range as possible of Andean social and cultural practices. So we're going to look at those in a second, but first here again is that passage from the sermon. So you can see it actually in all three languages. Sapos. Here they are. All right, so the Ten Commandments. Here we've got all 10 of them in Spanish and in English. Uh, and we're just going to touch base on these real quickly so that we can look at how the confessionario is manipulating them to prevent specific activities that have to do with Andean cultural practices. So the first commandment, no tendrás dioses ajenos, is used to cover religious activities. The sixth commandment, no fornicarás, covers all sexual activities. The second, fourth, and eighth commandments, so no jurarás, honrarás tu padre y madre, and no mentirás, are covering political activities. And then the seventh commandment, no hurtarás, covers economic activities and financial activities. So we're going to look at specific examples so we can understand more clearly how confessors could interpret and apply these different commandments to each Indian penitent to encourage them to be very compliant and obedient 
a lot of the questions in the Confessionario encourage Andean penitents to assimilate to Spanish and Christian social norms by forbidding all kinds of pre-contact social and cultural practices, like worshiping huacas, who were local deities that protected the people that lived in the area, also prevented or forbid uh, getting medicine or guidance from huilcas, who were Inca spiritual guides, or in Spanish often they were called sacerdotes, although that's not quite the right term. Drinking chicha, which is an alcoholic drink made from fermented grains, and also participating in taquis, which were religious festivals or dances to celebrate the huacas. All of these activities were considered idolatry, so they violated the first commandment, right, of, of no tener dioses ajenos. And here's another image from Guaman Poma. This is a drawing of huacas. So here you can see some of the huacas and they all can communicate with the Sapa Inca, the emperor of Tawantinsuyu, which was the Inca empire. He had a spiritual connection with each one. So we can see that the Confessionario prohibits all of these activities, but it also goes even further than that because it says that penitents will break the first commandment against having other gods by having any interaction at all with Wilcas, spiritual leaders, whom the Confessionario calls hechiceros. And also they break the first commandment by endorsing any kind of non-Christian custom in any way, right? So you can see Asadorado Huacas, Wilcas, Cerros, Rios, Al Sol, Otras Cosas, Aste Confesado con algún hechicero, which is what the re not, they're trying to refer to a Wilca, Aste Curado con algún hechicero, Has persuadido a otros a que idolatren y hagan cosas al modo de los antiguos, o has favorecido a los tales que persuaden eso, right? This is, this is the last point. Like, have you even entertained or been kind to people that participated in Andean practices? So by forbidding Andean penitents even to interact with spiritual guides, the confessor tries to kind of protect his monopoly over their conscience. He wants to make sure that he's the only person that's advising them about the right ways to think and act. And there's this very vague prohibition against doing things al modo de los antiguos, which basically means that he can forbid really any activity that he thinks doesn't conform to Christian or Spanish norms. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Confessionario has a separate section with, spe with questions that are specifically dedicated to Kodakas. And under the Inca Empire, Kodakas were the governors of Ailus, which were small communities or extended family groups of between 10 and 100 households. Um, but under the Spanish colonial regime, Kodakas were turned into more like overseers. Uh, they were responsible for collecting tribute payments that Andean laborers owned to, owed sorry, to Spanish land grant holders or encomenderos, which is maybe a word that you all have heard before. Um, so we can see that the questions for Kodakas also try to force Andean folks to assimilate to Christian norms because they hold the Kudakas personally responsible for eliminating Andean religious practices from their communities. According to the Confessionario, a Kudaka can violate the first commandment not only by committing idolatry himself, but also by failing to denounce idolaters or etiseros to a priest, by allowing idols to remain in the villages that he oversees, or by leading his supervisees or allowing them to participate in any non-Christian rite, right? Especially here, you can see, asecho taquies, borracheres particulares, públicas donde se hagan ritos antiguos y otros pecados. So here we can kind of see the priest trying to recruit kudakas as allies, as sort of fellow agents of assimilation by making the Christianization of their subjects a condition of their salvation. And by defining all of these pre-contact customs and religious practices as violations of the first commandment, confessors are trying to encourage the adoption of Spanish and Christian social norms, and also to create systems of self-surveillance and local surveillance against idolatry, takis, and other rights. Okay, so the seventh commandment, no us, you shall not steal, allows confessors to do something kind of similar with economic activities, right? it gives them an excuse to ask penitents about where all their money comes from. So the sin of theft covers straightforward things like stealing objects from the local church, but it also covers very subtle forms of financial manipulation like price fixing in the marketplace and also 
usury, which is today what we would call predatory lending. So here you can see, right? Like, have you stolen for something from the church? But also, have you tricked other people selling and buying things in the market? By the way, Tianguis is actually a description. It's a Nahuatl word, describes the same market that you guys were talking about in class. Uh, actually, the Quechua word for market is, is cato, um, but the Spanish kind of took words and then just applied them wherever they wanted without really paying attention to what indigenous folks called different things. Um, so then you can see also here's usury, right? Have you loaned money and made a bunch of money off of it? And so on. So certainly urging folks to sell their goods at fair prices in the market, to make loans at a reasonable rate, to pay people a living wage and to resolve all of their debts. Of course, that probably helps to protect the rights of other Andean people, but it also helps Spanish consumers and merchants and encomenderos to extract more money and more labor from the Andean folks that they do business with. So basically the confesionario is helping to uphold the socioeconomic hierarchy of the colony. It's treating Andean people's financial self-interest or their own desire to accumulate wealth for themselves as a sin with the goal of trying to ensure that all the wealth funnels up to the top, right? To the encomenderos and to the big institutions like the church and the crown that collect taxes rather than allowing that wealth to be more evenly distributed across different sectors of society. And this effort to capture any extra wealth that indigenous folks have accumulated is even more obvious in the questions for Kodakas, because part of the Kodakas job was to help Spanish tax assessors decide how much tribute the Andean laborers that they supervised should pay to their encomenderos. But because the Kodakas were descendants of Inca nobles, they themselves were usually exempt from paying tribute. So the confesionario, as you can see here, is very aggressive in trying to catch Kodakas taking money that belongs to anybody else, whether by skimming a little bit off the top of the tribute payments that their laborers are making to the encomendero, or by pretending that they're of noble lineage so they can get out of paying tribute themselves. And these questions are very forceful in tone. There's all kinds of scary words in here like usurpado, quitado, mentiras, right? Really, really aggressive words that convey this strong suspicion of guilt that we don't see as clearly in the previous questions. The implication is that the curacas are cheating the system, right? That maybe they're stealing their title from another family, an actual noble family, so they can avoid paying tribute. Or maybe they're collecting tribute payments from laborers who shouldn't have to pay any tribute and then they're just keeping the money for themselves. But it's important to remember, defining this kind of economic opportunism as a sin against the seventh commandment, on the one hand, probably does protect the interests of some of the Andean laborers that the Kodakas are overseeing, but it's also trying to ensure that wealth is concentrating in Spanish hands and not in Andean hands. So the last commandments that we're gonna look at are the second, the fourth, and the eighth. Right, And these are the commandments that encourage political obedience. So they're trying to get penitents to respect and obey various representatives of colonial power. In the confessionario, these commandments cover all kinds of political offenses. We got perjury, slander against clergy members and royal authorities, insurrection, and even the failure to inform on idolaters and rebels. So if you lie to a judge under oath, that breaks the second commandment against taking the Lord's name in vain because you've sworn something false before a judge, right? And across Spanish America, this was actually quite relevant because indigenous folks were very active in the colonial justice system and they participated in lawsuits kind of, kind of often. Um, between the 1550s and the 1570s, for example, the King of Spain actually brought a series of lawsuits against Spanish encomenderos in Peru for mistreating and demanding excessive tribute payments from Andean farmers and miners. And a lot of those farmers and miners were called to give evidence in court and they brought their quipus and they showed what they had paid. Um, on the one hand, this rule against lying to judges helps prevent perjury and it helps prevent miscarriages of justice. But on the other hand, it's protecting the interests of encomenderos and other Spaniards that Andean people might bring lawsuits against because it, it makes the Andean folks feel more worried about testifying. So it's saying, hey, it's a sin if you lie. And so you start to worry, if I say anything that's inaccurate, that's gonna be a sin. And now I feel uncomfortable testifying, right? 
This requirement of truth telling also extends to lies of omission. So if you don't denounce somebody to the proper authorities, you commit the sin of bearing false witness, right? So if you knew that somebody was practicing Andean religious rites or otherwise contradicting Christian law and you didn't say anything, then you're gonna go to hell. So above we saw the confessor trying to recruit curacas as allies, right? And Christianizing and surveilling people. And here the confessor's doing the same thing with the general population. So it's trying to make all the penitents into agents of church surveillance by making their own salvation dependent upon the way that their friends and their neighbors are acting. And the confessio nardio also tries to secure people's loyalty and obedience by making explicit rules against disobeying and against speaking badly about or harming any authorities of the church or royal authorities. So because their job is supposedly to look out for Indian folks' well-being, colonial functionaries like priests, like kudakas, judges, and tax collectors deserve the same respect and deference as your blood relatives, right? So have you honored your fathers, meaning your priests, but also abuelos, your family, sacerdotes, justicias, y kudakas, obedeciendo lo que demandan en cosas buenas. And then the other problem is that you need to speak only kindly of them, right? So according to the confessionario, honoring authority figures means showing them obedience, but also showing them submission. If you rebel against their power in any way, even if it's only in tiny ways, it breaks the fourth commandment of honoring your father and mother. So that includes uprisings and attacks, but it also includes insults and any kind of action that would go against an authority figure's interests. All those things are sins. So the confessor here is really clearly trying to encourage unquestioning obedience to colonial power and to nip any kind of resistance movement in the bud. And he also prohibits penitents from undermining authority figures like priests or curacas by spreading rumors about them, right? Has murmurado del padre o del cacique o de otros diciendo mal de sus cosas. So what's important here is that it wasn't uncommon for either clergy members or kudakas to take advantage of their power to obtain financial favors and also sexual favors. So we can see that while this question is on the one hand trying to prevent kind of malicious gossip and the fomenting of rebellion, it's also encouraging penance, penitents, excuse me, to keep certain facts that might harm an authority figure's reputation to themselves. In general, what we can see is that the confessionario is using the Ten Commandments to encourage obedience and self-sacrifice and to discourage resistance and self-interest, right? It's getting Andean penitents to police themselves against religious, economic, and political activities that would go against the interests of the colonial regime. So let's end with a fairly obvious follow-up question. Did this work? Not really. Even after the publication of the Confessionario Limense, Spanish missionaries were frequently complaining that Indian penitents didn't know how to make good confessions. They suspected that penitents were lying to them and avoiding them, and they even sometimes accused Indian Christians of having poca capacidad or corto juicio because they made confessions that, according to the priests, didn't make sense. By the middle of the 17th century, so within about 50 or 60 years of this publication, the Church of Peru was so frustrated by the persistence of Andean belief systems that they mounted massive campaigns of extirpation, which was basically just destruction, right? They burned huacas and other sacred objects. They punished idolaters with fines and prison sentences, and they prosecuted huilcas in court. But I have a question. Do y'all really think that it was that the Andean folks didn't know how to confess their sins properly? Or do you think it could be that lying and misunderstanding and keeping silent were forms of resistance to forced assimilation and church surveillance. We know that Andean communities mounted multiple large-scale resistance movements to Christianization in the 16th and 17th centuries, including a decade-long uprising called the Taki Koi, which was the Taki Sickness. And during that uprising, Andean people's bodies were inhabited by wakas who inspired them to reject the Christian God, who only cared about Spaniards, they said, and instead to perform songs and dances, takis, 
to honor the wakas who actually protected them. So there were these big movements, but there were also a lot of small scale forms of resistance. People would hide wakas to keep them away from the priests who were gonna destroy them. They would answer priest questions very selectively and strategically to protect other community members. And another thing that people did was that they repeated the exact same confession every year. So they would fulfill the requirement to make a confession, but they weren't actually confessing new or different sins, right? And none of this discussion of resistance is to downplay in any way the extreme and the very violent extent of the church's oppression of Andean people. But it's only to say that, as we've been seeing in the news yesterday and today, really big and really powerful institutions sometimes forget about the power and in particular the collective power of the individual will. The end. <laughs> Can that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Molly. That was fascinating. Thank you. Sorry, it went a little longer than I meant it to. I apologize. Thanks for sticking no with me, No worries. For my students, we've got class till 3.35, so there's still some time for people to hang out, and, and some of them may not have a class right afterwards, so um, we're, in, we're in no rush to get out of here. Obviously, people that have to leave can go ahead and, and log off, but um, there was uh, one question that was put in the chat right off. Um, where um, somebody asked pretty early on in your talk, um, if I can find it here. Um, what was the literacy rate uh, at the time that this was being used? What a great question. It was pretty low. Um, especially because in Quechua and Aymara, the systems of alphabetic writing of using the Spanish system of letters were pretty new. So that had really just started kind of in the 1550s and 60s and not that many people who were native speakers of Quechua or Aymara had had a chance to learn how to write with Spanish letters. Um, mostly people kept track of information in pictographic ways or with quipus, right? So that system of Spanish alphabetic writing was something that hadn't spread very broadly yet. Um, so what that meant was that indigenous folks didn't really have access to this document. Uh, there were a few exceptions, which were people who lived kind of in urban areas and were able to attend schools. So Guaman Poma is actually an example of this. Guaman Poma probably read this document. He seems to have been familiar with it based on other things that he wrote. Um, and he was able to read because he was able to attend a school in the place where he grew up in Huamanga because he was of a noble background. And so the Spanish regime recognized his social status and they allowed him to attend a fancy school. But folks who didn't have a noble background weren't allowed to go to school. So they didn't learn to read or write as regularly. Although some of them did learn to read or write uh, usually through interacting with priests. I actually have a question uh, and then I wanna open it up to the public and, and especially to my students, I asked you all to uh, ask questions so um, you can kind of be uh, gestating your questions here. But um, I was uh, really interested in this part about the priest telling them to hacer quipo uh, of their sins. Uh, by um, coincidence, uh, we actually read for today a article called Could the Incas Write? And it was all about the quipus. Um, oh. And in that article, um, sort of the thesis of the article is that we don't really know how to read them and that they've made some progress, that there are a few scholars that they talk about who think they've sort of perhaps cracked the code, but that we really don't know how to read this. And I think it's just fascinating that the priest um, referred to keeping track of your sins by making kipu by hacer kipu. Um, are there other uh, examples where you've seen the, the use of the word back then? How much do we know about reading kipus? Oh, what a fun question. I can't believe that that's amazing synchronicity that you are learning about kipus for today. Um, there is a project at, I think it's at Harvard. That's where the images came from that we looked at in the PowerPoint. And these scholars are working super hard on trying to read kipu from the 14th 
and or from the 14 and 1500s. Um, what I do know is that people do continue to use kipu now. So there's a professor at the University of Maryland. I think she retired kind of recently, but her name is Regina Harrison. And when she was in Peru in the 90s, she encountered a person who was on his way to confession and he had a kipu with him that he was taking and he was going to read his sins off of the kipu to the priest. So people were still doing this, you know, as recently as 25 or 30 years ago. Um, now, I'm not sure that those folks are using the same systems as folks in the 14 and 1500s, right? Um, and it's also my understanding that it's very difficult for most modern folks to read the kipus that were made then, even though we do have some preserved. Um, and you saw the image from Guaman Poma where he he drew a picture of the kipu kamayuk and then he made some symbols. But it's not very useful for deciphering the kipu because actually he didn't know how to read them. So it was more decorative than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, but they come up kind of a lot. And one of the people who was really, really interested in them was Jose de Acosta, who I quoted at the beginning. He is probably the reason that they were promoted in the confessionario because he was obsessed with them. He thought they were amazing and he really wanted to learn how to read them, but he didn't. Fascinating. Um, really is. What questions do you all have? Um, I think people can just, we can just try uh, the chaotic uh, approach. Just go ahead and jump in here and ask your question and we'll see how this goes. I had a question when you were talking about um, one of the sins being like if you know that someone had committed a sin and you didn't say anything, how that was also a sin. But then there was a part where you were talking about that sometimes they wouldn't say something about a priest because they knew it would hurt the reputation. Is that then considered a sin? Remy, that's such a great question. It That's really, really important to point out because it shows kind of how the confessionario is really oriented toward protecting the interests of the church, right? And not so much about protecting the interests of the penitent. Because ostensibly, yeah, it's like if you are being told that you have to reveal everything that you know that someone else does that's bad, or you're going to go to hell, but then you're also being told that you shouldn't say anything bad about priests or kodakas, like how can those both be true? They can't. That's such a great point. You're absolutely right. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Um, when you were talking about like the confessions and you were saying like the rules they had for when people were confessing sins and you kept saying she, when you mm. were like that, did they have any clear discriminations towards like men and women or was it all just like the same, I guess? Oh, that, thanks, Brooke. That's also a great question. So we didn't go into it in this talk because I honestly didn't have enough time and I didn't want to bore you guys, but there's a huge section about sexual sins, which is about the sixth commandment, right? And in that section, that's where you see more of the gender bias because all of the sins listed are oriented toward men. So it's like all of the, for specifically, sometimes it's like physical things that women's bodies can't do that only men's bodies can do. And then at the end of the section, there's just one sentence that says, reverse all the questions and make them appropriate for women. So it's total, it's like, there's this complete double standard where it's really oriented toward men and how they're supposed to behave. And priests are just supposed to kind of make it up at their own discretion, how they're gonna apply these rules to women. And so, Two things, just to kind of clarify and also emphasize why that's such a great question. The first one is, we know that the priests did not treat women penitents well, and they held them responsible for a lot of sexual behaviors that obviously were mutual and consensual activities between two adults. And we know that in part because we saw that picture from Guaman Poma where he shows the priest kicking the woman who's pregnant. And the implication is that that woman isn't married, right? And so a lot of times female penitents were being punished. The second thing which I mentioned at the end is that priests sometimes abused female penitents, right? Like sexually abused them. And so again, women were being punished for these behaviors that were actually 
at the inside, like the uh, initiation of the priest. But the last thing I was going to say is that sometimes I use the word she more sort of for clarity because priests have to be men and penitents can be women. And so then when I'm talking about it, it's a little bit clearer who is who. Um, but regardless, that's a really great question. I'm so glad we got to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Molly, since you brought up the picture, which we use for the poster of the um, woman being kicked by the priest, I was just curious, and another part of your talk that really struck me was, was the anecdote about the person who wanted to commit suicide because he was scared of confession and what might happen, what the priest might do. I think just the, just the um, fact that that anecdote endured and then that image it seems like there's some critique there of, of the priests and their abuse. I was just curious if you could talk more about how, who was behind those, those images and anecdotes getting published. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Hal. That's, that's such a cool question. The, the images um, that Guaman Poma drew, those are from a little bit later, about 50 years after the letter. Um, so I'll start with the letter. The letter is from 1577 and it's one of the cartas arnuas, which was a, a genre of writing that Jesuits did specifically. Other monks didn't and other monastic orders didn't do this, but the Jesuits were very intense about updating each other. And they had this rule that you had to write a letter once a year to Rome and update them about everything that had happened in the province where you were. So there's this huge archive of letters from the Jesuits that's in Rome. Um, and it has, you know, letters from Peru and from the Philippines and China and Japan and Mexico and Spain and Italy and Africa and India. There's letters from all over the place because these guys had to write every year. So that's how that thing ended up getting preserved. It's just sitting in an archive in Rome. And I happened to look at that particular letter from that particular year. It was just a coincidence. Um, but it also makes me think that this type of discussion was not infrequent. Right, Because if you can find it in just a random letter from a random year, there's probably quite a lot of discussion of confession and what's going on. Um, in terms of the images, Guaman Poma definitely created a very forceful critique of the church and the way that the church had been implementing evangelical practices in Peru. And it's interesting because he himself was a Christian, like a very fervent and pious Christian. And he actually worked for a Spanish extirpator, a person who traveled around Peru trying to interrogate people and destroy huacas and other sacred objects in order to promote Christianity. So he actually like assisted in that effort uh, in the late 1500s. But he was very critical of the church because he said that they hadn't, the priests were, were corrupt. They were more interested in pursuing their own physical and financial goals. And that that was why the evangelization process wasn't going very well. And he, so he blamed the priests and their behavior for the failure of Andean people to be interested in Christianity. Cause he said that the Spanish were doing a bad job of making Christianity look interesting and attractive. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> Um, I kind of have a question uh, had to do with um, the confession part where you said like the priest would come and like they would talk and kind of like try and get like the people to like confess something. Does mm -hmm. that mean like that more than once that they'd get like a false confession of something someone didn't did? Oh, what a great question. Oh, thanks, Felicia. That's so cool. Yes, I think the answer is yes. Sometimes people would make things up just because the priest wanted them to confess, so they would just invent something. Um, but also sometimes people did use confession as a way to get other people in trouble. So if you had an enemy, you could kind of make problems for that enemy by calling them an idolater or saying that they continue to worship wakas or other things like that. And that did happen on occasion. But more often people would 
make something up that was the opposite. So they would try to protect folks in their community who were still, you know, taking care of the wakas or making offerings to them. And it was just sort of a way of like obscuring some of that activity, um, just kind of stonewalling the priests more. But it, but people did sometimes confess things that were not true. And that happened also in Spain. That was a pretty common thing to happen in Spain. And people would go to the Inquisition and make false denunciations with not a lot of regularity, but it happens sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. So this is all pretty specific to the Andean region. Um, how similar or different uh, was it in uh, what we now call Mexico and New Spain or the Caribbean? Um, uh, where, for example, um, when Las Casas was trying to promote um, conquering through faith, um, was, uh, do you think that he had this sort of uh, vision of socioeconomic power uh, in mind uh, when he was saying how important it is to conquer through faith as opposed to uh, through violence? Thanks, Bob. That's such a wonderful question. So in the Andes, things were a little different because, as I mentioned, the Church of Peru was much more hands-on about how evangelization was supposed to happen. In the Antilles, it was pretty haphazard. And unfortunately, as I'm sure you all have already discussed in class, by the late 16th century, the Taino population was extremely, extremely small between abuse and exploitation and violence at the hands of Spanish encomenderos and also epidemics. There were very few Taino people that were still survive in, in survival. And so there was not a lot of coordinated effort to evangelize folks in the Antilles because um, the crown mostly said, you need to leave people alone because they're not going to survive. In New Spain, the Church of New Spain was also pretty hands off, but that was because there were so many it was such a large region and there were so many regional differences. And for some reason, the Church of Peru didn't really acknowledge the extent of regional difference within the Andes. Um, so in New Spain, what happened is that the church had a much more favorable view of the encomienda system. They thought that encomienda was actually the best way to evangelize people. And so they mostly had missionaries working through encomenderos. And so they would, a, a missionary would kind of work in a specific region with a group of people that were like located in one place, um, kind of a smaller collection of people. In Peru, the church was actually pretty anti-encomienda. In fact, because a lot of the people who were in power in the church of Peru were good friends of Las Casas, they were Dominicans. So there were people like Domingo de Santo Tomas who actually wrote the first Quechua grammar uh, in 1560. And there were people like Jerónimo de Loaiza, who was the first Archbishop of Lima. Um, and Loaiza was, he was, he had an encomienda himself, but he was pretty anti-encomienda more generally. And so he kind of followed Las Casas and their idea was actually something very different. They thought that confession could also be used to enforce better distribution of wealth by recapturing stolen wealth from conquistadores and encomenderos and giving that wealth back to Andean people. So they wanted to use confession, not just to acculturate Andean people, but also to punish Spanish people and then redistribute the wealth so that the whole society had a sort of higher standard of living. Any other questions? I did have another one. Um, you were saying like in the 13th century, it changed to when you would confess like once a year instead of just once in your lifetime and how like the severity of the penances kind of like went down. Um, do you know though, like if the priests ever gave penances to the Indians that were like in the Spaniards favor? Like, ooh. Oh, that's such a cool question. And I don't know the answer and I wish I did. Now I'm gonna have to go research that. Oh, that's such a cool question. My guess would be that they were largely trying to be kind of neutral, but I can tell you this, 
there were a bunch of priests who were kind of on the payroll of encomenderos. Um, and so the encomenderos would kind of bribe them to look the other way when they did things that were against the law. For example, they would do things like, the, well, sorry, some of these are kind of complicated, but they would do things like they would buy the tribute goods from their tributaries, the Andean people who paid them tribute. They would buy them at like a super low price. And then they would ask their tributaries as a favor to transport all of these goods really far away to sell them at super high prices, right? So it, they'd be like, oh, it's just a favor. You're helping me out. But they would be extorting a ton of labor from people. And often it was really dangerous because you'd have to climb mountains and it would be really cold. And then your pack animals might die. It was awful. And so then the encomenderos sometimes would pay a bribe to the confessor to like not make them pay the tributaries for the labor that they had given. So it's not quite what you were asking, but it's sort of related, which then makes me think that maybe priests were doing what you suggested. That's good to know though, thank you. Very sneaky, what a great question, thank you. I'm gonna have to think about that one, see what I can find. I had one more question. Um, I have never like heard of any of this and I was just wondering how or what got you into researching this and like what was the initial spark or like first idea of learning of this that you wanted to like pursue learning more about it? Oh, thanks Brooke, that's such a nice question. Um, I will say that I didn't hear about any of this when I was in college either. Um, so, and I didn't even take a class as cool as the class that you're taking. Uh, so you guys know way more than I knew, which is awesome. Um, I think that the place where I got very interested in this was actually a class that Holly and I took together when we were in graduate school. Um, and we started reading all of these manuals of people who were teaching other people how to pray. And they were being very sneaky because they were, so the person I'm thinking of in particular is a, a Spanish writer named St. Teresa of Avila. And she wrote these very complicated manuals that would teach other women, especially how to pray, but she wasn't supposed to teach them because the church forbade that. And the church was very particular about mysticism. So she was super sneaky in the way that she would write these manuals so that she could actually teach people about how to do mystical prayers without getting punished by the inquisition. And so then that just sort of became this like big rabbit hole of like, what are all these manuals and why are people publishing them and what are they using them for? Because it turns out that even though they can be kind of boring to read sometimes, they show you so much stuff about how these institutions worked and how people interacted with them. So it's like kind of window into what real life was like, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's probably you. a lot of cool stuff. Oh, no, thank you. I'm trying to think about like what we can, what we're going to leave behind from now, you know, that's going to serve the same. I mean, maybe it's going to be like TikTok. I don't know. But it's cool to think about like what traces we're leaving behind that are showing what institutions are watching us and how we're negotiating with them and resisting them. One of the other things that we've been talking about in class is how the model for the conquest uh, in the uh, uh, evangelization and the military conquest in the Americas was very much based on uh, what they'd already been doing on the Iberian Peninsula against the Moors uh, and I guess to a certain extent to the Jews as well. Um, so I guess, um, there's probably some parallels, right, with this uh, confessional practices and what they would do. Um, and, and even, um, and we have not talked about this in class yet, um, but uh, there are people called conversos uh, who uh, were, I think, primarily Jewish people that were forced to convert to Christianity uh, in Spain uh, at this time. And then their descendants uh, are living, some of them in New Mexico near us. And uh, in the last, I don't know if it's been maybe 30 years or so, people started to realize that some of their families have cultural practices uh, like 
I don't know, wow. lighting candles on Saturday night or something like that. And they never really knew what it was. And these trace back to Jewish customs that these wow. people that didn't even realize that they had Jewish ancestors were practicing secretly Jewish rituals uh, for all these years that they continue to do in New Mexico, even though they're Catholic. And um, I guess kind of what I'm connecting here is this idea of uh, secretly confessing one thing and doing something else uh, had also been going on uh, even back in the Iberian Peninsula with Jewish people and I would assume probably some Moors as well, no? Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's very much the same. It, it was almost a direct translation of a lot of the same strategies that that Catholic authorities had implemented in Spain. And part of what's complicated is that, sp so Spain, Confession was actually a much more effective instrument of social control in Spain, in part because Spain is way smaller, right? And also because everybody spoke one language. So that made things a lot easier for the priests. Um, but also because the Inquisition had power over everybody. So anybody who was Christian, which included all of these people who have been forced to convert from Islam or Judaism to Christianity, all those people were under the jurisdiction of the Inquisition. So they were they had a lot of pressure to behave in particular ways. Um, but there's something kind of interesting that changes from Spain to America, which is that folks in Spain who were Jewish and became Christian, they didn't look any different from Christian people, right? This sort of racial component was not there. But in America, there was this sort of immediate stigma against folks who didn't look Spanish, right? Against folks who were indigenous or were mixed race, who, some people who were African or African and indigenous, right? All these folks had this sort of like immediate suspicion. The church was suspicious of them automatically and they were treated really differently. So they're, the two systems were, they intended them to be very similar and, and the missionaries tried to implement a lot of the same rules that came from Spain. So this confessionario that we were looking at, it was copied actually from the confessional manual that Pope Pius wrote during the Council of Trent. So it was designed for use in Europe. And they tried to like translate it, but then you can see all the stuff they added, like clearly the things about wakas were not in the <laughs> Council of Trent's manual. So, but it's, it's such a great connection. Like they were really trying to translate these practices and they just didn't work the same way. Um, in part because they were dealing with people who like didn't speak the same language and also had not been like had a completely separate culture, right? These were folks who had their own polities, their own nations, their own very complicated long-standing systems of faith and belief. And it just doesn't work the same way as when you've got a bunch of people who are used to living together, right? It, it just, it didn't, it didn't work. And so it became, it became very violent. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, thank you. I think, um, a uh, bunch of my students here have stayed on way after class. So uh, oh, that's great. Thank you all so much for doing this. I know it was interesting. Um, uh, now I think you should go play in the snow a little bit. Yes. And um, I will see you all on uh, Tuesday and um, we will catch up. I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording here. And if you wanna stay on for a little bit, Molly, we can just chat oh, for absolutely. a second here. But um, oh, thank you all so much. Thank you for these questions. They're amazing. I'm so appreciative of your time and your energy and your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much.